Well, in the initial part of the war, these were the only women that were being accepted for military service. And actually, it's not so much of the barrier, you had to be a nurse, you had to have you know, nursing training sort of thing. They could be discerning, but you had to go through a morality test basically to make sure that you were the right type of girl that they were looking for. You had to be unmarried, you had to be 21. A lot of women responded to that in Canada, especially as the war goes on, they really need nursing sisters. A few Huron County women enlisted right away to go overseas and you know, 1914 they signed up and they continued signing up. You can see a lot recently graduated from nursing school and then they'd enlist in the war right away. July 5th, 1916. R has moved her bed into a tent, hoping that she may escape the bed bugs. Really, she'll soon be a nervous wreck if she does not get peace from vermin soon. Every night lately, she has had the light on searching for them. July 21st, 1916. Had a bed bug hunt and found plenty, so I went over my canvas bed with coal oil. Also the cracks in the wall. I am truly disgusted. A group of my patients who were able to go outside. I really think they look much stronger and better in the picture than when seen face to face. Don't I look like a vulnerable grandmother to them all? Maud Sterling. January 7th, 1916. Had a most exciting morning. German airships bombarded this hospital and many bombs were dropped near us. Really, I didn't see how we could escape the bombs for the ship seemed right above us. One bomb fell quite near the stores, another near Hospital 29, and one near our hospital, and one of the guards was wounded by shrapnel. The anti-aircraft of the Allies kept firing at the Germans, and the sky seemed full of shrapnel. One shell from our guns burst over our mess, fell next to the tent, and burnt a hole in the table and chartboard. The shell case was about eight inches long and three inches wide. I fear we will have frequent raids now. January 14th, 1916. The dugouts are progressing and we'll be ready for the next air raid. I hate the thought of leaving our patients and running to save ourselves in dugouts, but I fear we'll have no choice. We were congratulating ourselves on our uneventful crossing and laughing over such unnecessary precautions as lifebelts in one's bunks and the ship's boats in readiness over the sides until we docked in Liverpool and learned the appalling news of the sinking of the Lusitania. We had passed over the exact scene of the disaster 10 hours after it had occurred. We were given one week in London to look about and incidentally add to our wardrobes. In that time, we stared awestricken at Westminster compared the Thames in scathing tones with our own St. Lawrence, saw the King, and struggled vainly to appreciate English humor in various theaters. Then daily, our numbers grew less, reinforcements for the hospitals in France. At the end of two weeks, there were 26 of us left, including our matron, Mrs. Jagged, and we were sent to Shorncliffe to transform more barracks into a hospital for Canadians. At first, it seemed almost an impossible task, but even when we left, not quite three months later, it was almost a real hospital. Surely none of us will ever forget those first weeks in Lemnos. The burning heat, the flies, the wretched food, and the absolute uncanniness of the whole place. The only water came from two condemned wells and was so scarce that each pailful had to be indented for and the chit signed by the commanding officer. We lived chiefly on bully beef, biscuits, and army issue jam, and innumerable flies, which had an intensely irritating habit of becoming entangled in one's food. I wish I could give you some adequate description of the Canadian nurse at the front. We are all well acquainted with her good work in peacetimes in the various hospitals at home, but only those who have seen her at the war, in the times of greatest stress and danger, can imagine how wonderfully good and useful she can be. Her untiring energy, her patience, her fearlessness, her self-sacrifice and ability have been to us a constant source of wonder, 
The trained nurse has done much to rob the most terrible part of war of its horrors. She has made the wounded feel that a mother's love, a sister's care, and a clever woman's skill follow him wherever he goes. The papers uh, follow and print the letters of a lot of our local nursing sisters. Clara Ferguson from Clinton and uh, Maud Sterling from around the Bayfield area. Here in Goddridge, we had uh, Alma Dancy who served at Gallipoli. She married the uh, son of a Canadian senator that she met over on the Gallipoli Peninsula. Miss Dancy says that the day on which the weekly mail arrives is one of great excitement. She never before realized how delightful the Godrich local papers are. I even read Hodgkin's advertisement, she continues. It's queer here. We are so near the very thickest part of the struggle, and we never know any news at all, except what we read in three-week-old English papers. Of course, rumors go around all the time, and we are all buoyed up only to hear the next day that it has been officially contradicted. The officers on the battleships and destroyers have been very kind about asking us for tea. It's awfully interesting going over the ships and seeing how the big guns work. We are out of tents now and have gone into huts, so we are all prepared for the rainy weather. Believe me, when it rains in this place, it is no gentle shower, but a raging torrent. However, the spring begins about February, so that's not too bad. Another nursing sister, she was the daughter of the Goddard Collegiate um, Principal, Helen Strang. She was living in the States, and she joined the elite Queen Mary's Imperial Nursing Service. And she had a very distinguished career. She was even promoted, and it was said she was very kind to her patients. Red Cross Supplies Appreciated. The following interesting letter from an Exeter nurse now at Salonquia to the local Red Cross Society and speaks for itself. It will no doubt provide a stimulus to the ladies in this vicinity. Salonquia, November 29, 1915. We have only been in Greece about two weeks and since material for our huts had not arrived, we were obliged to pitch tents which were most unsatisfactory owing to the exceedingly high winds which occasionally blow the tents down since the soil is too soft to hold the sticks securely. Unfortunately, this is the coldest weather they have had in years and the amount of sickness is appalling. Each day there are two or three convoys and sometimes more come in and the poor things are nearly perished for it often means that they have had a drive in the ambulance of 40 or 50 miles with only one blanket over them, unless, unusually, fortunate when they get two. This morning at 4.30, for I'm on night duty, a convoy arrived that had been on the way since two o'clock the day before. During that time, they had nothing to eat or drink and were nearly perished. Of course, we apply the artificial heat available, but as you may imagine, that is limited where we have so many and we have to melt snow frequently to get water for the hot water bottles. It is then that we turn to your boxes and get them done up in a nice pair of slumber socks, flannel shirts, etc. Also knitted scarves, for they wear them in bed wrapped around their heads and over their chest for the cold is so penetrating. Never again will I murmur a complaint so long as I have bread and butter, good water and heat. Can you imagine yourself drinking the river water? We wish we had some, for the amount of chlorine required to keep the water from contamination makes it almost undrinkable. I have not taken a drink for five days. However, we are in luxury compared with the boys in the trenches, and not one complains. At present, I am wearing the usual underclothing of woolens, two sweater coats, a Jaeger pajama coat, a flannel warmer, and a great coat. I have discarded skirts and am wearing khaki trousers and puttees under my coat and long rubber boots and manage to keep fairly warm. I remain, very sincerely, M. Edna Dow. Address, number four Canadian General Hospital, British Force in Greece. From Salonkia to London, 
The following interesting letter is from a former Seaforth girl, Ms. Minnie Best, who has been a nursing sister at Salonkia, Greece for the past years or more, to her aunt, Mrs. J.D. Hinchley, describing her trip from Salonkia to London, England, where she is now on duty. Bassingsoke, September 9th, 1917. Dear Aunt Jean, do you notice that I am able to at last put my abode at the top of the letter? I wasn't able to do that in Greece. We were not allowed to put our address in any place on the letter conspicuously. Now we are free to do as we please in all things. The journey was a dangerous one, but we traveled only by night when on water. In all, we took 17 days to come from Salonkia to London. We left Salonkia, and this is the last time I hope I shall have to mention the names of Salonkia. On the 16th of August, by the transport Aragon, only the sisters of all the Canadian hospitals and two medical officers from each. Our first night, convoyed by two torpedo boat destroyers, took us as far as the island of Skyros, just off the city of Athens. We anchored all day there. The next night took us to the island of Milo, the famous Venus, the bust of whom was found in the 12th century. That night we left for Crete, staying three days there. The next night we left for Navarino. I never experienced such heat as we felt on the ship in those Aegean ports, and the next for Kerfuten. Both of these trips were convoyed by Japanese torpedo boat destroyers, in whom the British sailors have the greatest confidence. We reached the city of Turnin at midnight, had a bath, and went to bed in the hotel. It was delicious. We spent a day shopping and boarded the train again at 4 p.m. I might say that Italy is even more wonderful than the tales I've heard of it. It is a perfect flower garden with Prague vines festooned from tree to tree. I cannot describe it. I'm glad to have seen it. From Turnin, we went through the Alps, and the Italian Alps are wonderful. Once again, I cannot describe them. The, the natural scenery, the waterfalls, the villages nesting at the foot of the hills, all are wonderful. We spent that night also in the train and reached Paris at noon. We spent two days and two nights in Paris shopping and sightseeing. Shopping the first afternoon and sightseeing the next day. Everything is too expensive to buy. The girls bought some blouses. I like Paris for sightseeing and London for shopping. We reached Southampton at night and London at noon. We slept the first two days and shopped until Thursday afternoon when we left for Bassingstoke. And here we are until our trunks come when we will go on leave someplace. We had planned on Scotland, but all feel too tired to go yet. So it may be that we will go to Cornwall first and spend a short time there resting up before we start traveling again, because we are tired right out. And I, for one, cannot go on duty again until I've had a good rest. We walked in the other day through little English lanes and hayfields. It was delightful. I'm learning to ride a bicycle as that is the only means of locomotion in England. At present, we are most unsettled. Cannot stay at anything for any length of time. I've only written one letter since I left Slankia. I, I sent you a card from Paris. Did you get it? Lovingly, Minnie. The one nurse from Godridge that um, lost her life, she was actually living in New York, working at a New York hospital. She became a lieutenant. In Canada, they were called nursing sisters. In the States, they early on commissioned them. And she served in Europe in 1918. She's uh, after the war, of course, not everyone's coming home right away. But in 1919, she was killed as a result of an auto accident. And she's buried at Chateau Thierry in France. She died in the line of duty, basically. And there is a monument in the Maitland Cemetery to uh, Lieutenant Florence Beatrice Graham. From a Canadian nursing sister, the following very interesting letter was written by a former Seaforth girl to the secretary of the local Women's War Auxiliary in acknowledgement of the Christmas box forwarded from here. Ms. Best has been on active service since early in the war and for two years was stationed in Salonkia. January 2nd, 1918. I received the box which the Women's War Auxiliary sent me last week. It was very kind, indeed, of them to remember me. In fact, the people at home are too good to us. The cake I gave to the patients, who were being sent to duty before Christmas in, in case they didn't get any Christmas cake. They enjoyed it, as all good Canadian boys enjoy good things to eat. 
The gum I distributed in a ward of ten beds, all in a row, and shortly afterwards I went into the ward, and on each bed sat a patient with jaws working double time. I stood at the door and laughed. Gum is almost entirely unknown among the British troops. I remember when I was in Salonkia, I had mother send me a whole box of gum. There was an officer, ill in the ward, from the same regiment as a boy I knew from Toronto. I gave the officer some gum to take up to my friend who was medical officer in the regiment, but before he left the hospital, he confessed he had chewed all the gum. His first experience, he said. We have almost no British patients now, all Canadians, and we do enjoy them. I have a ward, or five wards, of 78 beds, and there is a great variety among so many. The first ward play cards all day long when they are not studying, for we are teaching the university course here, and a great many of the patients are taking French, German, or mathematics, penmanship, and drawing. The second ward is what I call the self-supporting ward. They amuse themselves individually and work in the same way. The third ward is the fancy work ward. They do beautiful work, embroidery and colors, centerpieces in white, raffia, baskets, drawings, and all sorts of things. One man with only one hand had his pair of hoops fastened to his locker by means of a vice and won first prize at the fancy work exhibition with his work. The fourth ward is the pessimistic ward. They took down their Christmas decorations. The whole atmosphere is created by one man. Isn't it astonishing where one's influence ends? I'm going to put him in a small ward by himself if this continues and see what will happen. The fifth ward is the happy-go-lucky place. Very untidy, but willing to try to do better, but scarcely know how. I hope I'm not boring you with all these details, but I'm so tremendously interested and I'm sure you all are too. We had a lovely Christmas. The patients had tablecloths, most important almost. Turkey, plum pudding, mince pie, apples, nuts and grapes, and the sisters went down to the dining room and helped serve it. Each patient found a filled stocking at his bedside in the morning sent us by the U of T. In the evening, Mark Hamburg played for us a real treat which the patients thoroughly enjoyed. When they do not enjoy a concert, they are not afraid to say so. Altogether, they are just splendid boys and I do admire their pluck. So far, we are really more or less a convalescent hospital as the building is not quite finished yet, but is a huge place we will make a splendid active treatment hospital very shortly. Please thank the women of the auxiliary for me and for the nice box and season's greetings. Yours very sincerely, Minnie A. Best. And the patients continued to arrive, Australians and New Zealanders and men of Kitchener's army, more sick than wounded, and the hospital was increased from 250 beds to 500, and to 700, and finally we could take in 1,000. Each nurse had a little fire on the ground outside of her tents, where she cooked food for from 60 to 80 patients every two hours, besides performing her other duties. There was no brow rubbing or hand holding in Lemnos. Then our sisters began to realize that in a hot tropical sun, one could not do the things one had done in England. At the end of 10 days, Sister Monroe died. We saw the crude wooden coffin made by a Greek in a little village nearby brought over, swaying from side to side on the back of a donkey. We sat through the burial service and watched the transport wagon go off to the lonely hillside where she was buried. After that, everyone was sick. Some fortunately stronger than others managed to keep up. By November, there were 15 of us left. Two had gone home mentally unbalanced, the others very ill. Our commanding officer, senior major, one of our chaplains and three officers also had gone, with a great many of the non-commissioned officers and men of the unit. There was, however, no decrease in the number of our patients. On Friday, January 25th, we left Lemnos. We who had known it from the first felt that something had been lifted from us, that we had awakened from a hideous nightmare. And then we looked back at the hills, already becoming faint in the distance, and remembered the two brave women lying there in what, even to us, would soon be a distant land. <laughs> 